Good morning again. Can we bow our heads in prayer, please? Father in heaven, we, we come to you this morning in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we come, Lord, in a spirit of humility, with thankfulness in our hearts blessings that you have bestowed on us. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your great gift of salvation. We thank you that you sent your Son, your only begotten Son, into this sinful world to save sinners. We thank you for his life. We thank you for his ministry. We thank you for the words that he left us. We thank you for what he did for each one of us, Lord, at the cross in Calvary. We thank you for his death and for the shedding of his blood. And we thank you that three days later he was resurrected and that he sits alongside you at your right hand. We ask, Lord, that you would bless our service here this morning, that it would be acceptable to you, Lord. We pray for people on their way, people who can't be here, and people who are watching online. And most of all, Lord, we thank you again in your holy name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to look at the first verses in the book of Acts. If you remember last week, we, at the introduction, I looked at the, the second coming of Jesus while James was preaching on the promise of a Savior. James will continue teaching us this morning on, on Jesus and, 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 and his birth. And quite often, and it's an easy thing to do, we forget that he's actually coming back. And he has promised in his word that he's coming back. And last week we looked at Zechariah. And we looked at exactly where his feet are going to touch when he comes back. Can anybody remember where? The Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives, Mary. Thank you very much. Yeah. And we spoke a little bit about the geography of Jerusalem. When he arrives back on the Mount of Olives to get into the city, he'll walk down through Kidron Valley, and then up again. Um, to the city itself. And we get confirmation in the New Testament of this. So let's look at the first chapter of the book of Acts. And I'm just going to read into it. It's my verse is verse 11. We read into it from the start. The former account I made of Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commands to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, 
and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. This same Jesus. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is near Jerusalem. So, in like manner, Jesus will come. Now, in Matthew 24, when Jesus is asked by his disciples about signs at the end, he mentions a number of things at once, but he also mentions something three times or four times, depending on which translation you read, and that is, do not be deceived. And you remember he said, many will come pretending they're Christ, yeah? There will be many deceivers. So we're told from Zechariah, and we're told here in Acts, how exactly and where exactly Jesus is coming back to and how he will come back. And the important thing to take home today is that he is coming back. He will fulfill his word and we as believers in him will be there with him. That's the day to look forward to. So with further ado, we, we thank the Lord for his faithfulness to his word in the past and to his promised faithfulness for the words that he has yet to fulfill. And we'll stand together and we'll sing to our Saviour. Thank you.
kids are on their way out, and James is coming up to preach again, so we'll just, we'll just commit everybody again to the Lord's hands. Father, we thank you for this morning, um, we just ask for your hand of blessing upon the kids as they head out, and for the adults who are going to be with them. And we ask, Lord, again, that you would bless James in the words that he has for us this morning, that they will be of you, Lord, and that we would each take something with us today that would change our life. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning everyone, uh, thank you uh, uh, Sean uh, for leading us in worship uh, there. We're just going to uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, and just reading a couple of verses, verses 6 and 7. But to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. As uh, Sean has already mentioned uh, this morning, we last week we looked at uh, the fact that uh, God has given a promise to humanity uh, that he is going to deal with the problem of sin that occurred there in the garden of Eden. And he promises it right there in the garden. He, he will not let it go. He's going to deal with it. And so as we move on in, in, the, in the few weeks that we have <laughs> to look at this this year, we move on to a period of time when God's people, uh, the people he'd chosen out of all the peoples of the world, and has set them apart to be a light to the nation so that God's promise will be taught and, and known by the nations. We move to a period of time when it seems that like everything is going wrong. Isaiah is about 750 years uh, before uh, Christ, uh, roughly about years or 750 years, somewhere in that uh, ballpark figure. Uh, and he's, he's writing, as, as all prophets do, he's writing about a specific period of time, but he's also giving us a much bigger picture. He's also revealing something of the big picture that God is trying to teach his people as well. So it's, it's about his time, about events that are going to happen there and then. It's about events that will happen in a lead up to the big story as well. We, we know that Isaiah uh, prophesies that um, uh, the 
people will come back to, to the land uh, and uh, he, he is very, very specific in his detail in how that will happen. But he's also, as I say, talking about the bigger picture. He he's, has a message about the Messiah's coming and ultimately his return when he will establish his kingdom once and for all, as well as, as Sean has reminded us this morning, uh, Christ is coming back. And so Isaiah, we, we see this in, in the book of Isaiah, we see very specific events that happened in and around Isaiah's time. So that will happen between then and Christ's first coming. He prophesies about Christ's first coming as well. But then he goes on to say this is what it will be like in the end. This is what God is doing. This is a big picture. So that when our eyes are open with faith, we can see. And when things happen, we are not deceived. We know whether it's of God or whether it's not. That is Isaiah's message. So that we are informed. So that we know. And of course, as, as we're, we're in Adam, we're, we're, we're uh, getting ready to celebrate Christ's first coming, uh, to, to celebrate his birth as, as a child. Uh, this morning we're going to look at that very specific prophecy in, in Isaiah where he tells us a child is born and a son is given, which we reign. And we've got to read this in light of what we looked at last week. Remember in Genesis 3, we, we noted that God has promised to save to deal with the source of sin. Not just the consequences of sin, not just the mess that we see around us, but the actual source of sin. My own, des my own desire to replace God. To be God in my own life. That's where sin comes from. And God has promised to deal with the source of sin. He has promised that he will send someone. That someone will come and will destroy sin, will destroy Satan through suffering. And Isaiah tells us how this is going to come to be. In Isaiah 9 verses 6 to 7 where we looked at this one. He tells us that this someone is going to be born a child. And this someone is the son who has been given to us. So let's look at this a little bit more in more detail uh, this morning. Isaiah tells us that at a specific point in history, a child will be born. And you might say, well, that's, no, uh, that's not big news in, in that sense. There's children born every single day. And we praise God for that. But the difference between this child and every other child is that this child will be the fulfilment of God's promises. As I've mentioned already this morning, Isaiah writes these words uh, in chapter 9, around 750 years uh, before Christ. It is a reminder that God has not forgotten his promises. Do you ever get to a point where you, you wonder where you question, has God forgotten what he is saying? I mean, it's 2,000 years plus since Christ ascended to heaven. And we're still waiting for it to come back. It could be easy for us to question, is he actually coming like he promised? Because we, we live post-Christmas. Uh, so, so therefore we, we can see God fulfilling that promise. But promises that come after his death, death and resurrection and ascension, we can struggle to sit. And God's people who have received these promises and been passed down to them from 
generation to generation, they're starting to question. They're starting to question, has God forgotten his promises? Has God forgotten about us? Of course, we know that Isaiah is writing in a time of uh, political, economic, uh, and even spiritual turmoil in the life of, uh, uh, of, of Israel, of, of Judea. They were about to be taken off into captivity. And when he first receives his first uh, vision, uh, remember in chapter 6 that uh, Isaiah, uh, King Uzziah has just died. And he, he sees his vision and he sees a vision of how sinful he is and how holy God is. So Isaiah is getting the picture is getting to understand why the place is in such turmoil and is going to be in such turmoil until they're counted off into captivity once more. A reminder that they are a sinful people and that God is only bringing down on them when he's already said will do. Remember in the garden, God brings judgment on sin. Because he is righteous, because he is holy. But in the midst of that judgment, he doesn't leave us just fearing the judgment. He gives us his promises as well. And so Isaiah is speaking into this, and he's, he's telling them what is going to happen, how they're going to be judged, how they're going to be punished because of their sin as God's people. So, so let's see if we recognise that as God's people, we are not immune to sin. Even in our redeemed state, we can still rebel against God. Just as the people of Israel did. It's a reminder that God has not forgotten His promises. Remember the, the promises that we looked at last week, Genesis 3:15, that a descendant of Eve will come and crush Satan. In Genesis 22, verse 18, that all the world will be blessed through a descendant of Abraham, the father of the children of Israel. And in Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7, we see that the descendant of David will rule forever. There are just three promises that I've, I've picked out for us this morning. There's hundreds and hundreds more. We don't have time to get, go through every single one of them. Read the Old Testament, you'll, you'll pick them up. Even Numbers, even Leviticus, read it. You will see God's promise, God's grace, God's mercy coming through. So Isaiah is saying that the child to be born, this child that he's telling us who will come in the future in his time, will bring all these promises that God has given in the Old Testament. He will bring it all together. That God has not forgotten his promises. God has not forgotten his people. God has not forgotten the problem of sin in this world. And he is doing something about it. He is going to do something about it. And this is the plan he had right in the garden. And he's revealing to Isaiah, this is how I'm going to do it. Watch and wait. And be ready. Verse 6 teaches us that the Messiah, the promised one, the fulfillment of God's promises, needs to be born a child in order to come to humanity.
He needs to be born a child in order to come. Why God chose to do it that way, only He knows. But that's the way He has chosen. And, and for the sacrifice to be made for sin, for it to be a perfect sacrifice, for, for Christ's life and death and resurrection to accomplish what God wants it to accomplish, he has to come as a human baby. I remember a reading, uh, uh, an illustration on, on, on uh, sin and uh, God coming down uh, in human flesh. Uh, and it was about this uh, uh, a little bird who had, who had, um, who had got injured uh, and uh, couldn't fly off, couldn't, uh, couldn't heal himself, couldn't do anything. He was absolutely helpless, and this this uh, this man who, who finds him wants to care for it, wants to uh, uh, look after it, and, and uh, but he can't get the bird to come to safety. The bird won't let him touch it, won't let him bring him in, won't let him do anything. And he's getting really, really frustrated. He says, oh, I wish I could become like a bird and encourage him in so that I, I can become one like him so that I can lead him to save him. So I can encourage him and show him. Can we get a glimpse of that, with that story, what God is trying to do? He has to become one of us to lead us to the place of healing, to the place of safety, to the place of wholeness. A child is born. But a son is given. This is speaking of the pre-existent Son. Giving His Son to humanity so that we could be one with our Creator. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, we see that the Son has always existed. Uh, in Genesis 1, as I said, verse 26, we, we read these words. Let us make man. It goes on to say, in our image, and explain what man's role on earth will be. But this, this phrase, let us make man, that's God speaking. We know through the years that this is the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Always in that order, but co-equal, co-eternal. The Son has always existed. In John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was a Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word. We know the Son is referred to as the Word. In the beginning, how did God create the world? He spoke. The Word. And it happened. The Son has always existed. From before time until time in eternity. The Son is equal with the Father. The Son, this is 
as much the son's plan as it is the father's plan. He is 100% on board with it. And as an obedient son, he humbles himself and obeys his father and comes to earth as a baby. The child to be born, or the child that was born in, in, in our day, is the son, is the pre-existent son of God, the second person of the Trinity who has always existed, was there in creation, was there in the promises to Abraham, in the promises to Eve, in the promises to David, and so on and so forth. He was there leading them out of Egypt into the promised land. He was there bringing them back from exile, back into their own land as uh, Nehemiah was rebuilding Jerusalem and, and the, the, the walls of Ezra rebuilding the temple. It was the same God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, all of it. And as part of God's redeeming plan to rescue humanity from the source of sin, the Son comes and is born that first Christmas. But he goes on to say that the sun will reign in verse 7, or verse 6 and uh, 7. The sun will reign. He says the government will be on his shoulders. This is pointing us not just to the fact that the people of his day will reject him and will murder him, but actually, it's also pointing us to the fact that one day Christ will reign and all authority in heaven and earth will be in his hands. He will reign supreme as king. Because that is the position the Father has given him. And he will reign as king as the son. He will reign as king as the second person of the Trinity. He will reign as king as God. We know this because Isaiah reminds us the names of God. Who the son, the child that was born, is called. Wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. These are the names that the son will be given. The names of God Himself. So there's no doubt in Isaiah's mind, as he's writing these words, having been inspired by the Spirit to write, as he's received his vision, as he's received his message to give, there is no doubt in his mind, and there should be no doubt in our mind. That the Son is God. Just as much as the Father is. Just as much as the Spirit is. And that the Son and the Father are one. He reminds us also that the Son will reign to fulfill the promise to David that his descendant would sit on the throne of God's people forever. That the son that is going to be, the son that is given as this baby, as this baby is born, is going to be a descendant, a direct descendant of King David himself. And we will look a little bit more on that uh, next week, uh, both Christmas Day and Chris, uh, Stephen's Day, and more fully on Stephen's Day. It's a direct descendant of King David himself. The, the king that unified the tribes of Israel together. There's only two kings who actually held all tribes together. 
King David and King Solomon. Saul never managed it. And then every king after that thing was a divided kingdom by then anyway. There was always two kings until the northern kingdom fell. And then the southern kingdom fell and then that had a king since. In human terms. Because remember when the people asked for a king, Samuel reminded them that God is your king. They've always had the king. The king has always been Jesus, the Son. His descendant will sit on the throne of God's people forever, and he will reign with justice. He will reign with justice. In other words, the right thing will take place. And it's God's justice which is above and beyond anything we can imagine. And so therefore no one needs to fear him because we know that he will lead in true and full justice and all who have ever lived will receive true and full justice. We only need to fear him if we rejected him as our king. And the source of sin is our rebellion, our rejection of God's kingly rule and placing ourselves in his place, saying to God, I can do better than you, rejecting his way of salvation is the same as saying I can do better than you. I can say to myself, I don't need you. So therefore the justice I receive will be in line with that decision. However, if I accept and I receive his offer of forgiveness and of mercy and of grace, I will receive the justice that comes with following the King. All will receive true and full justice. He will also reign in righteousness. Righteousness, remember, means being right with God. He will reign to bring people to be right with God. He himself is, and his people will be. It reminds us that he is holy and set apart, and therefore his kingdom is holy and set apart. Therefore the citizens of his kingdom are holy and set apart. Of course we live in a now and not yet time. Christ came as a baby. He died and he rose again and he ascended back to heaven and we are waiting for him to come back and to fully and completely establish his kingdom. With the new heaven and the new earth which we read about in Revelation amongst other places, the whole of scripture is pointing us to that. But that's where we get it in its detail. We are to live in his kingdom now as well as eternity. He will establish it completely at his second coming. And in the interim period, while we're waiting for the fullness of this to be completed, we recognise we are in his kingdom. If, we are, if he is our king, if we are his citizens, his royal subjects, then we are in his kingdom now as well. And that has implications into the way we live out our lives now, based on the way he will rule in eternity. We are to live with justice. We are to speak up for justice. We are to stand up for justice. We are to show up.
to all those who are marginalized, to all those who are rejected. When we look at the life of Christ on this earth as, as a man, he was known as a friend of sinners. He was known as someone who would spend time with lepers and beggars and tax collectors. None of us like paying tax, I know. <laughs> but they're human just as we are. He was there for the marginalized were rejected. And as citizens of his kingdom, we are called to do the same. To declare the love, the grace, the mercy of Christ Jesus to the world. As we tell them who Christ is, what he has done, how he has purchased salvation for us, it is to be done with justice. We are also to be people of righteousness. We are to live in righteousness. We are to proclaim the work to the world the Lord. We are to proclaim the word of the Lord. Sorry, I misspelled that. We are to proclaim Christ born. We are to proclaim Christ crucified. We are to proclaim Christ risen. We are to proclaim Christ reigns. We are to proclaim Christ's return. That is the message we speak this Christmas. That is the message we speak every single day as we live as citizens of his kingdom, our King, our Lord, our God, our Saviour. Isaiah reminds us that God has not forgotten his promises. He has not forgotten them. He did not forget them then. He has not forgotten them now. Christ came as a baby. He fulfilled the promises that God had given. And he is continuing to fulfill his promises since he is ascended to heaven. And he will come and return and bring his people to himself. A child has been born. The son has been given. In conclusion this morning. A child has been born. The son has been given. The only real question is, do you believe that? Do you accept that? Do you accept citizenship of his kingdom? And if so, are you going to join him in speaking up, standing up and showing up for the marginalised and rejected? Are you going to join him in proclaiming the word of the Lord that Christ was born, that Christ was crucified, that Christ is risen, that Christ is reigning and that Christ will return. Amen. Shall we pray? Lord God, we thank you and we praise you this day because you were born as a child. Lord, that you gave your son to be born as a child. That he lived in this world that he showed us what justice is. He showed us how to meet people's needs. He showed us how to proclaim the word of the Lord. He gave us our message. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We ask, Lord, that you will equip us to live as true citizens of your kingdom. Here in Ireland today. Lord, we know, Lord, that we live in difficult times. We live in times Lord, where the world is rejecting you all over again. We live in a time Lord, uh, where people uh, 
that so focused on what's right in front of them, they fail to see you. And Lord, when we, as we reminded yesterday, Lord, when we look at ourselves, Lord, we are, we are only terrified. When we look at the world around us, it only brings fear. Lord, when we look to you, we see the creator of the world with us. We see the creator of the world meeting our needs. We see the creator of the world calling us into his own kingdom. God, reach out and call us again. Bring us into your kingdom this day. In your name, Lord. going to uh, sing together uh, just now uh, before we share uh, any announcements and definitions. Thank you. Oh yeah, we'll uh, have the pleasure as well. Thank you.
Just a couple of announcements uh, for you this morning. Uh, first of all, don't forget our carol service at 6 o'clock uh, this evening. Uh, you're all welcome. Uh, please come and, uh, and bring somebody along with you as well. Uh, we've got live music tonight as well, so uh, that, that'll be uh, good. Uh, some friends uh, are able to come and help us uh, this evening. Uh, and then next Saturday, the 25th, that's Christmas Day, we've got a service at 11 o'clock at uh, Man and Nancy's house. If you don't know where that is, I'm not quite sure where that is, then just speak to us and we will gladly give you uh, the address uh, for uh, sat Saturday. And then next Sunday, uh, the 26th, uh, we won't be meeting here, we will be online only. Uh, we'll be live both on Facebook and YouTube uh, at 10.30. Sunday the 2nd of January, we'll be back here at 10.30 for our worship here in this hall. Thank you. Shall we? Uh, Not this year, no. Just going to read to us uh, from Isaiah uh, chapter 9 again. Uh, just to remind of these words as we finish uh, this one. But to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Amen. Thank you. God bless.